This is a very important topic for trustees, but it's an even more important topic for members in terms of the returns they will get, and, and particularly in terms of the risks that they face. And risk is a very emotive issue, uh, particularly amongst retirees, if they experience losses, uh, they get hit very hard. I spoke first on this uh, topic in, in a general form about five years ago, but I think it is worth revisiting the topic again this year for a number of reasons. The first is that when I spoke then, from 2003 to 2007, equity returns had been high, volatility was low, the Australian market was up about 125%, and there was a lot of focus on the accumulation phase of retirement as opposed to the, uh, uh, the pension phase. And there seemed to be little concern with the level of equities in the Australian uh, industry. From 2008 to 2012, equity returns were much lower. Volatility was much higher. The Australian market over, those five -year over that five-year period was down a little over 20%, and there's now much more focus on the pension phase, and there's many more voices saying that potentially the amount of inequities in the industry is too high. As Craig mentioned, there's been a number of very prominent Australians who have actually made the case that potentially the risk is too high. And their arguments are well-reasoned and quite nuanced, and you're never going to give uh, you know, proper attention to them in one or two minutes. But just to read one or two quotes so you can see the kind of things that were being said. Paul Keating, I think at this conference last year, said, the tax system should encourage annuities instead of lump sum superannuation payouts, and the industry is underinvested in debt instruments. There's too much equity and too little in longer term fixed income securities. And David Murray said, default superannuation funds are too skewed towards risky assets such as shares because of a long standing flaw in the system. And as Craig said, uh, Ken Henry, Jeremy Cooper, and others have made similar comments. And the final reason to actually look at this topic again is we get the, the start of the new legislation on MySuper coming into effect uh, from July this year, and that has new and increased trustee responsibilities around this and other issues. What I want to do is go through the first five topics relatively quickly to build the case so we can look at trustee responsibilities and, and think about the issue of asset allocation and particularly the amount invested in equities. But before I do that, I want to lay out the framework that I'm going to use uh, because it'll run through the, the five topics there. And the framework that I'm going to use is a twofold framework at the start. First of all, it says the way in which you manage a pool of assets depend, depends upon how and when you will use those assets, the liabilities. So there's, a, there's a, a concept called asset liability management, and increasingly, people say, when you look at a pool of funds, think about what the consequences will be and how the drawdowns or the payouts will be in the future, and that will give you an indication as to how you should uh, invest the assets. And I'll come back to that um, as, as we go through these topics. The second is to say that when we optimize across a, a portfolio, we should optimize across all assets. Not only assets in the pool directly under control, but what's called shadow assets of the risk bearer. And the shadow assets are other assets that will be used potentially to support uh, the, the payments in the future or, or the uses of the funds in the future. And if the assets in the pool fall short, they'll be drawn upon to bolster those assets. So shadow assets are typically non-traded other resources available to the risk bearer. And within that framework, there's two reasons to hold a particular asset class. The first is because you think that asset class will, that, that asset will actually increase in value, the returns are way positive. It's a wealth creation reason. And so the primary reason to hold an asset is often uh, you know, because of wealth creation. But there's a second reason to hold an asset, and that's because of risk management uh, reasons. And risk management reasons is first rel firstly related to the liabilities. You hedge the uncertainties with the liabilities with certain classes of assets. If the liabilities are pretty fixed and stable, you want to set a pool of assets that are fixed and stable. If the liabilities or the future spending are uncertain, in certain economic circumstances they will be higher, and in certain economic circumstances they will be lower, you use assets which will pay off more in one, one set of circumstances when the economy is strong and pay off less when the economy is weak. And so the risk management around liabilities is you hedge the uncertainties with the liabilities. The second is that you think about the shadow assets and you try not to double up on the risks. 
So if you have these shadow assets or other resources, and they are particularly large and stable and secure, you can take some extra risk in the pool of assets you're managing. If the shadow assets you have are very volatile and uncertain, you want to be a lot more cautious in the pool of assets that you're managing. And so what I'm going to do is go through, uh, you know, number one is really the wealth creation reason, why to hold equities at all. Two and three are the shadow assets of uh, members of your funds, uh, the, the non-traded assets that were used to support them in retirement. Four, I'll give you some uh, brief comments about uh, international comparisons. And five really starts to look at the liabilities and what this might mean for how you invest the assets. So let me move on to the sources of investment returns. Most default funds and balance funds seek to give their members something like CPI plus 3 to 4%. And the key investment issue or focus for trustees is how can you deliver to members 3 to 4% per annum after fees and taxes on a consistent basis. And there's really five sources of returns that they can rely on. The first is the yield on government inflation protected bonds. This is a base rate that is available across the entire market. So essentially the government offers uh, CPI plus uh, a certain real rate of return on certain bonds, and depending upon what that real yield is, that's the rate that you can achieve um, uh, with, with virtually no risk. The second is what will happen to the prices of your assets um, as real interest rates change? And the second one here says really, will your fund face a headwind or a tailwind in terms of the returns? Typically when real interest rates fall, the prices of other assets, your equities, your infrastructure, your property, your fixed income securities will rise, and your members will get a boost in terms of their returns. And typically, when real interest rates rise, all the values of those assets will fall, and the returns on your members will suffer. You'll face a headwind. And so the first two is really, what is the current yield on inflation-protected uh, inflation bonds? And the second is, are those rates going to go up or go down? Are you going to face a tailwind or a headwind? The third is the expected premium that you can get from exposing the member to some broad economic risks. And this is one of the, the, the risks are equity-related risks, uh, credit-related risks, uh, illiquidity, uh, uh, assets that, uh, that might do badly if inflation were to hit and, that, and those sort of things. And the question you've got to ask is, has your member got the capacity to bear this risk? Because in the long run, there's the potential they will earn a return. It's an expected premium, they're not always going to get it, and so you've got to think about their risk appetite and their ability to bear risk. The fourth reason are net returns after fees to active management, and the caution must always be said at the beginning that the average returns after fees and taxes to active management are zero, or, or maybe even less than zero. And so across the industry as a whole, that fourth one is not going to add consistent value to all the funds out there. Potentially, it can add value to some funds if they think that can, they can consistently identify uh, above average managers, but that's proved to be very hard to do. And the last one there is noise, luck, and unexplained factors, and you can't obviously rely on that for consistent returns. So essentially, unless you've got uh, an ability to choose above average managers, you're relying upon the first three, and the first two depend upon interest rates. I'll show you what's happened to Australian government real interest rates over the last 25 years. And the blue line shows you over the last 20 years when the industry has basically taken the form that we've got it in at the moment. Real interest rates over the last 20 years have averaged three and a quarter percent. And real interest rates have fallen pretty much over the last 20 years. And so the industry as a whole has faced a, or a, a, has, has benefited from a tailwind. So if you're a trustee and you're thinking of giving your members three to four percent above inflation, and the average real rate available in the market, the base rate is three and a quarter percent, and you've got a tailwind, it hasn't been that difficult to give uh, three to four percent above inflation to your members. If you look at where real interest rates are at the moment, the yield on long-term government bonds, real government bonds, is one and a quarter percent. And there's a much greater likelihood over the next 20 years that real interest rates are going to rise. And so the current base rate is about a third of what the base rate has been over the last 20 years. And instead of facing a tailwind, we're facing a headwind. And so the circumstances facing your members are pretty tough, and that's why I think it's worth, again, considering the risk premium on, on risky assets. It makes an enormous difference to your members if, they earn, if you earn 4% over their accumulation retirement phase versus if you earn 2% over the accumulation retirement phase. It about halves the amount uh, that they will have in retirement uh, as an income. 
Let me go on now to the, uh, the first of the shadow assets and probably the most important shadow asset for uh, most of your members and particularly the members in default funds. Actually, I forgot to do the start of the time, so you'll have to you know, control me on time. Um, some characteristics of the age pension. Uh, there's about a little over 3 million uh, Australians over the age of 65. The pension plus basic supplement to a single pensioner uh, is about $20,000 a year, and the uh, age pension plus uh, basic supplement to a couple is $30,000 a year. Taking some uh, estimates of who gets what from a Rice Warner study uh, in uh, uh, August of 2012, where they looked at uh, reforming the age pension, almost 50% of retirees get the full age pension, uh, about 30% get the part age pension, and uh, about a little over 20% are self-funded. Now, as the system matures, and as we go from a superannuation guarantee of 9% to 12%, maybe the first two numbers will change, and maybe the, the amount of self-funded retirees uh, will reduce slightly. But a very significant number of, uh, of, of retirees get the age pension. Uh, you can see there that uh, amongst 65-year-olds, one in four get the full-age pension when they go into uh, retirement at 65. And you can see that within 10 years of retirement, it's one in two retirees are getting the full-age pension. The age pension is an unfunded scheme. It's paid for out of tax revenue, and it's paid for by future taxpayers. In 1970, the number of working-age Australians per Australian over 65 was 7.5 uh, to 1. It's currently about 5 to 1. And by 2050, it'll be 2.7 to 1. And so there's naturally talk about whether the age pension is sustainable and will it change? Will the superannuation system itself be sustainable in terms of the tax uh, incentives and, 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 uh, and, and some of the issues and that was covered this morning? Uh, and in, in fact, the whole tax system. So there could be changes, and that's something that, that needs to be taken into account. And you can also see that it's a means-tested age pension, and there's a variety of tests but the tests to get the part age pension are relatively generous. If you look at the bottom line there, a couple who own their own home and have a million in other assets can still get a part age pension. To estimate the value of the age pension, what you need to do is know what the age pension is, estimate how you think the age pension will grow over time, uh, look at life tables to see what's the probability of someone being alive one year hence, two years hence, three years hence, etc., and then discount it all to find the present value of it. I've taken the growth rate in age pension as 1.6% in real terms. This is the growth rate the Treasury used in modeling for the Henry Review, and it is also uh, the average real wage increase in Australia over the last 30 years. Um, I've taken the discount rate as 1.5%. Uh, the real yield on government uh, bonds to 2030 is about 1.28% at the moment. And then I've taken uh, life statistic tables. You can see here... Oh, sorry, not technically competent. You can see here that the value of the age pension to a couple both age 65 is nearly $700,000. So it's an incredibly valuable resource for retirees in Australia. You can see that the value of the age pension per person is, a, is half of that. And you can see that the value of the age pension to single retirees is a little bit more than, the average, than half the average uh, to the couple. You can also see that the value to women is higher than men, and that's because women live longer than men. And, and finally, if you look back in the column, you can see that the value of the age pension to some of your younger members is actually very close to the value to your older members, and that's because while they won't get the age pension for a number of years, the, the amount of age pension that they will get if it grows at 1.6% per annum will actually grow almost, at, well, a little faster than the discount rate. To see how sensitive these answers are to changes, what I've done here is instead of taking the growth at 1.6 and the discount rate at 1.5, if you go to this column here, if the age pension grows only half as fast and, and real yields go up to about 3.5, you can see that the value to a female age 65, the age pension falls by about 28%. And you can see that the value to a 35-year-old falls by about 70%, and there's a much more um, uh, defined change between younger members and older members. What this says is right at the moment with very low yields, the cost of buying an annuity is extremely high. Let me look at the other... Um, 
shadow assets, the other source of retirement income. And what I've used here is Australian Bureau of Statistics, Wealth uh, Statistics. The first two columns represent uh, households where the reference person is over 65 and in the first years of 10 years of retirement, or over 65 and uh, beyond the first 10 years of retirement. The last column is a subset of the other two. So within these households is about 14% of the population. And I've just given this, the, the last column there uh, for reference. You can see the level of home ownership is extremely high amongst current retirees. Whether the level of home ownership will be as high when the system matures in 20 or 30 years' time is not so certain because house prices are much less affordable now than they were uh, uh, 20 or 30 years ago. You can also see that the government pension is the main source of income for six out of 10 retirees in their first 10 years of retirement, and three out of four retirees beyond the first 10 years of retirement. And for a large number of people, it represents more than 90% of their gross income. In other words, it's virtually all they have. One out of three retirees in their first 10 years of retirement, and one out of two uh, retirees beyond that. And for single retirees, it's one out of two. The average, uh, uh, or the, the average age of the reference person in the first column is 69, and the average age in the second column is 81. If you look at the wealth statistics, you can look at the assets of the average retired um, householder. So the first, um, the first set of charts of people or households with the reference person is in the first 10 years of retirement, and the second is beyond 10 years of retirement. The average household in the first 10 years of retirement has about 175,000 in super. And the average household has a claim on the age pension, which is worth about 332,000, which is the red uh, bar there. So the claim on the age pension for the average retiree in the first 10 years of retirement is about double what they have in super. They also have assets in investment property, uh, assets outside uh, in, in other financial assets, and in their own home. Now, wealth in Australia is not evenly distributed. And so what, what the numbers up there represent uh, the average retiree. But if you look across the population, the top 20% of Australians own about 70% of the wealth outside their own home. So if you look at net worth excluding their own home, the top 20% own about 70% of the wealth, and the bottom 80% own about 30%. And so for most retirees, the amount that they have inside super, the blue uh, bar at the beginning, and the amount that they have outside super in investment property or in other financial assets will be much lower. But given the means testing of the age pension, the amount that they can claim or the, the value of the age pension will be much higher. If you take a typical uh, household in that first uh, group there, 65 to 74, two people who are both 69 and have a typical size household of 1.9, the claim on the age pension would be worth about 520,000. Looking now at equity holdings across countries, and I didn't attend the last session because I was getting myself ready for this, but I heard that uh, the amount of uh, equities in, in Germany is something like about 3%. The data on how much is invested in equities across pension systems around the world is actually quite difficult to get. First of all, it's quite difficult to find out what is exactly inside the pension system or the superannuation system and what's outside of it. But it's also quite difficult to work out exactly what the asset holdings are. You can look at our own self-managed super funds, which is nearly 480 billion. The ATO statistics say that the amount invested in equities is 32% of self-managed super funds. But if you take into account listed trusts, unlisted trusts, and managed funds, that's another 18%. And it's difficult to know what those trusts and managed funds are, whether they're all equities, whether they're balanced funds, or whether they're cash funds, or whatever. But be it as it may, th this data comes from a study by Tiles Watson uh, in 2012, global, global Pension Assets. And while the numbers differ across studies, broadly they all show the same. Australia has a pretty high proportion of its uh, industry invested in equities and much higher than many other countries. And it's not that other countries have less in equity, but more in infrastructure and direct assets and property. Our investment in, uh, in bills, bonds, and cash, which is the other side of growth assets, is much lower than many other countries. But we differ from other countries in a whole variety of dimensions. One dimension on which we differ is defined benefit, defined contribution. Again, the data is pretty difficult to get because a lot of countries have defined contribution uh, schemes, which is what we have in accumulation system, or defined benefit systems, which we, uh, schemes, which we know what they look like. 
but lots of countries have hybrid systems. You can see that a lot of those countries there have a very high level of defined benefit, whereas uh, clearly Australia has uh, a much, level of, much lower level of defined benefit and much higher defined contribution. The US, uh, from the Towers Watson study, says that 57% of their assets are defined contribution. The OECD uh, study puts it at 40%, but whatever the number is, it's, it's relatively low. We also differ in other countries in terms of how big the pool is relative to gross domestic product. Uh, in Japan, the pool of savings is about 25% of GDP. In, uh, in Canada, it's about 65%. In Australia, it's about 110. And in the Netherlands, it's about 140. And all these things can have an impact on, um, on the way we invest. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the retirement strategies, and then I'll bring it all together. The retirement strategies is probably the most complicated of all uh, the, se the, the sections that I've got to deal with, because this is really the hedging argument about asset liability management. The question I'm asking on this first slide is, should defined benefit, this sounds to me very loud uh, in a, with an echo, it's okay? Uh, should defined benefit and defined contribution schemes have similar equity exposure? And I'll just go through the argument that I laid out at the beginning in terms of liabilities are important and shadow assets are important. If you think about a defined benefit scheme, the retirement income is independent of investment outcomes. The defined benefit is normally linked to years of service and salary um, uh, over a period of time or at retirement. And so the, the, um, uh, the retirement income is relatively certain. And on a matching principle, a hedging principle, you want to invest in relatively certain uh, assets or relatively safe assets. And so from a risk management point of view, you want to hedge the future defined benefits with relatively safe assets, i.e. bond type of investments. Under an accumulation scheme, basically the outcomes in retirement are linked to investment outcomes. What you want for your members is if they need a lot of money, if economic circumstances are such that the prices of goods and services are higher, if wages are up, if most of their friends are living better, you want them to have assets which will actually perform better. If the economic circumstances are such that you know, wages are down, profits are down, prices of goods and services are down, then maybe they don't need as much. And so you hedge the uncertainty there with things that, that look more like assets which link to economic conditions like equities. So on a liability point of view, defined benefit and defined contribution maybe invest slightly differently. The second thing is what about the shadow assets? Well, the shadow assets are the assets that can be used to meet the, the, uh, the liabilities of the, uh, the risk bearer. The risk bearers are completely different under defined benefit and defined contribution. And so under defined benefit scheme, it is a sponsor. And I've taken here the sort of the corporate defined benefit scheme. So if you have a company that's offered defined benefits, if it runs short of assets inside the, the pool of funds, it needs to draw on other resources to, to boost those assets. Where does it draw on those? It draws on the company's profitability or its equity. And so each shadow asset looks like equity, and inside the fund, they don't want to double up on that risk. So they potentially want to invest more conservatively. If you think about defined contribution, the risk bearer is the member, and their shadow assets, if they run short, are, they, are their assets outside super, their income earning potential, they can retire later, or the age pension, they look like very safe assets. And so that gives them the capacity to have slightly more risk uh, inside super. The second one is really, even under defined contribution systems, it depends on how you draw down the assets in retirement. If you draw down the assets in retirement via an allocated pension, in other words, you have a sum of money and you take out four, five, six percent as you get slightly older, then in fact your retirement income depends upon investment returns during the years of retirement. If you think about a 60-year-old who's going to retire at 65 and die at 90, they're thinking about the next 30 years. If, on the other hand, you, at retirement you buy a life annuity from an insurance company, then the 60-year-old is really only worried about the next five years, and they're really worried about what interest rates will be in five years' time. And so if, if you have a life annuity type system, so Chile has a defined contribution system, and the Netherlands has some defined contribution type uh, schemes, but it's a forced annuitization. Under forced annuitization, of course you want to invest much more in fixed income securities, and that's the comment that Paul Keating was making. The shadow assets are the same in both cases. So let me try and now wrap this up, and then we can have a few questions. The new trustee obligations under my super, um, 
is to manage the assets of the trust on behalf of beneficiaries in the best interests um, and in the beneficiaries' best interests. Interest. Trustees are only responsible for the assets of the trust. They are not responsible for the members' other assets, their own home, their assets outside super or whatever. But the, the, um, the uh, explanatory memorandum says, in managing the assets of the trust, the trustees must include consideration of the level of investment risk appropriate to members, and in uh, considering the level of investment risk appropriate to members, in other words, what's their risk appetite, their ability to bear risk, they may consider age as well as other relevant factors. So the other relevant factors I've, I've outlined here is, first of all, the claim on the age pension dominates the balance in super for the average retiree, and because we know wealth is not evenly distributed, for most members of uh, industry funds and most members in default funds, uh, it's going to be um, a much higher uh, claim on the age pension than, than their total value in superannuation. The second thing is that when we think about their assets outside super, when government pensions represent more than 90% of gross income, most of that money held outside super is very conservatively invested. Very little of it is in shares or equity or, or, or those type of instruments. In comparison for self-managed uh, you know, uh, retirees, where government pensions are less than 1% of gross income, then quite a lot of that money is held in equities and, and incorporated businesses and, and equity and growth type assets, and the same with investment property. The third comment there is that the value to a member of the part age pension compared to the full age pension is greater than their current percentage. If you have a member who retires and is eligible for 50% of the age pension, the value of their claim on the age pension is not 50% of the value of the full age pension. And that's because in the second year of retirement they would be eligible for 55, then 60, then 70, etc. So the value for someone who retires eligible for 50% is probably has an age pension worth about 80% of the full age pension. And the last comment there is, is maybe a, a slightly more complicated one, and I won't necessarily go into it, but when the value of the age pension is lower to, to people who only get the part age pension, it has even better risk management characteristics in the sense of the, the means testing says that if your other assets do badly, your claim on the age pension will go up. So if we go back to the assets of the average retired household, the average retired household, and I'll just do, just do households in 65 to 74, has about 175 uh, thousand in super. When you take into account their super and their non-super, it's about 511,000, and when you take into account their claim on the age pension for the average retiree, it comes up to about 843. And remember that for the, 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 uh, the members whose assets inside super and outside super are lower, their claim on the age pension will be even higher, and so the last column will actually uh, be even greater. What is the equity exposure for the average retired household? Well, if you look just at super and you take into account uh, just the default funds and the average for APRA, it's about 53% is in domestic shares, international shares, and listed property trusts. When you look at the equity holdings across super and non-super, it's about 39% for households in their first 10 years of retirement. And when you take into account the age pension, it's about 24%. And when you consider that most retirees have less in super and non-super than the average retiree, in other words, those first two values are lower and their claim on the age pension is higher, the amount of exposure that most of your members and default funds have to equities is around about 20%. So in summary, most Australian retirees rely on the age pension as their main source of income. Six out of 10 in their first 10 years of retirement, three out of four beyond the, you know, the first 10 years of retirement. The age pension is a very, very valuable and extremely safe um, asset to retirees and exceeds the value of their uh, superannuation savings. The majority of uh, retirees have very limited exposure to equities in their non-superannuation assets. And so an equity exposure of around 50% in super implies about a 20% exposure across the total portfolio. And the question is, should we have a narrow perspective and look at the industry on its own, or should we have a wide perspective? And I must say, I was encouraged by uh, the results of that first poll, which says that about 70% of people says that we should consider the assets of the members outside super. So let me hand back to Craig. Thanks.